Thank you, band, for preparing our hearts and our ears for the word of God. Jesus spoke to them again in a parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servant to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said to tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have, have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. One went off to his field and another one went off to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and even killed some of them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then the king said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone that you find. So the servants went out to the streets and gathered all the people that they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. And he asked, how did you get into here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants to tell Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Now you guys can be seated. So um, when I was on social media uh, a few years ago, I regularly felt left out. Uh, I would regularly get on and I'd see, and I'm sure many of you who are in the social network landscape and get on and see endless pictures of people enjoying themselves without you can relate. Um, and, uh, and so I, I felt left out. I, 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 I'm sure I, I can remember thinking things like, how come I didn't get invited to go to the baseball game? Right? How come I didn't get invited to go to the party? And I don't think anybody necessarily meant uh, to leave me out. Maybe they did, because I'm kind of a party animal, and I, you know, I... But, but what matters is that it really feels good to be invited. I think about times when, um, you know, I was younger, I was like in high school, and that junior, that senior invites you to that birthday party, and you feel kind of, oh, cool, like the freshman got the invite. Uh, or or you, you keep going, and, and a friend of yours invites you to spend a week with their family at the beach for the summer, or you think about the time when someone invited you to a wedding, or, or when, better yet, somebody invited you to be a part of the wedding party, to be a bridesmaid or a groomsman or something like that. There's significance in being invited in almost every way. Uh, I've messed this up royally in my marriage, by the way, um, and so maybe some of you ladies and gentlemen can relate. Uh, but, but there have been plenty of times where I have just made the assumption that my wife knows she's always invited unless otherwise stated. Uh, but my wife is far too humble to think that she's always invited. And, uh, and so there have been times where she, like I've left her out of the board game or I've left her out of the situation or the thing that, that ultimately she was hoping to get an invite to as well, um, and, and she always comes to me and she always says, you know, Derek, it's just nice to know you're invited. It's just nice to know that you've been invited. And that's so true, right? Like all of us can kind of relate with that. When you hear it, you know it's true because there's something profound in us that desires to engage in a deep level with others, especially those who we have the most intimate relationships with. The invitation, it has power because what it says is, I want you. I mean, that's, that's ultimately what the invitation does. It, it says, I, I want you. I want you to, to be at the party or the event or the wedding or the church or the family reunion, the dinner, the game night, or whatever it is. I want you. And Jesus tells this story in Matthew 22 about receiving a wedding invitation. And it seems to be um, something that he's, he's calling his guests, or, or at least, very least his guests, to something new. 
And, and I'll explain what I mean by something new as we go forward. But uh, it, it, I, I, I like that thought because I remember when we got married, um, the bride had to bring something borrowed, something blue, something old, and something new. Do you guys remember that? And I think it's cool that Jesus is inviting us to bring something new to the banquet in our invitation. And so we're going to talk about what is this thing he's calling us to? What is this new thing he's calling us to bring? The story Jesus tells is very interesting, and it's often misunderstood. Uh, but there are lots of elements to it. It begins by talking about a king and his son uh, who is getting married. And we often miss that this story is about God the Father and Jesus the Son. And, and, and we miss that the wedding is the uniting of God to his people, his bride, the church. And, uh, and Jesus is saying, this is what the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like people who were invited to take part in this amazing uniting of God and his people. And Jesus moves on to tell us that some very important, prominent people were invited. And yet also rejected the invitation. They, uh, these people uh, represent the religious and political leaders of Israel who had the power to lead God's people into God's way of life, into God's kingdom, and the way God wanted the world to work, but they didn't do it. And then the prophets came along in the Old Testament, and they were speaking to these people, the religious and political leaders, about their inability to do this, and they spoke and they shunned them. And, they, and they, they shun the people saying, why don't you do this? You need to do this. Because you didn't do this, this is going to be the result. And what ended up happening is when the, the prophets would speak, they would incite uh, really, really bad things to happen. And these religious leaders and political leaders did not like what the prophets were saying. And so they would drag them off and beat them and abuse them or even kill them. And this is what Jesus is alluding to when he talks about the servants who went and they tried to proclaim the invitation, and people wouldn't receive it. Instead, they, they drug, drug them off and beat them, abused them, and killed them because they were maintaining to their own affairs. They were maintaining to their uh, way of life and their way of doing things instead of God's way of life and God's way of doing things. In the story, uh, they chose themselves in, the, in, in their kingdom over the king and his kingdom and his invitation. So what does the king do? Well, he finds more servants, it says. Uh, the word in Greek is doulos. We've used this word before. We've talked about this word before. But the, the word in Greek is doulos, and it, it, it is often used to refer to Jesus' disciples. And so I believe that this is what Jesus is talking about here. And he sends them into places that, to convene with all kinds of people. People ultimately that most religious and political leaders were too bothered by or too afraid to associate with. And it would seem again and again and again as the story of the scriptures show us that the lowest of esteem in our world are elevated to be invitees into the kingdom of God by his grace and by his love. And so who shows up at the king's table? All the riffraff, right? It, it, it seems to be this very scandalous deal, to be honest. Jesus is telling a story, and he's telling a story about how all these people from the corners in the cities came to the banquet, where people would have been like, that's not right, that's not appropriate. But this is what we seem to like most about the story, right? Because if we can put ourselves in the story, we all realize we are the riffraff. We are the tax collector, the sinner, the prostitute. We are the one who lacks the qualifications to be at the king's table and yet got invited and responded. And so we love that part of the story and we wish the story ended there, don't we? Kind of like last week, we wish the story ended before Jesus actually ends the story. And he keeps going. And Jesus says that... What is next is a requirement for those who have been invited. And that you can't just come as you are. Or better yet, you can come as you are. But you can't expect to say who you are. Does that make sense? I think he invites everybody in as you are. But the requirement 
is that you can't stay that way. In this story, it talks about a man who was removed from the banquet because he didn't wear the proper clothes. Now, this really hurts some of us who grew up in churches, doesn't it? Where certain clothes were required in order to feel like you were a part or maybe you were shunned if you didn't wear certain things to church on Sunday morning. People like my grandfather, for instance, who dealt with a, uh, a disease his entire life that uh, made it very difficult for him to, quote unquote, dress up to show up at church. And so he never felt qualified or like he was uh, able to be a part of a family of faith or a community of faith until he was old. And uh, last couple years of his life, he started coming to a church plant that Mallory and I were a part of that met in a, in a uh, community center gym. And uh, he brought his lawn chair and sat in the corner. And, and, and as, he, as he passed away in 2015, he said, Jesus and I are good. Because he had found a way to the banquet. And he found that it wasn't a requirement to dress a certain way or, or put on some sort of facade in order to show up and be a part of a family of faith. And so Jesus, this is not the petty nature of what Jesus' story is about. It's not about, hey, you showed up here today wearing a t-shirt and shorts because it's hot and humid in North Carolina in July. You don't belong here, right? That's not what Jesus' story is about. And anyone who would like to disagree with me, you can send me an email, but you would be wrong for sending me an email, okay? <laughs> what Jesus... What Jesus is alluding to in this story is he's invited, like when we are invited to the king's table, to the wedding banquet, to see his son and the bride, we must take the proper steps, in the words of Paul, to take off the old self and begin putting on the new self. This is what Jesus is talking about. This is the new thing that we're like supposed to bring with us to the banquet. And this bothers people for a couple of reasons. It first bothers those who are fairly well-versed in the Bible and theology because they believe that that would imply that we must clean ourselves up and do some work in order to earn our salvation. And that's not what Jesus is saying. And I would agree with you. If, if, if that was what Jesus was saying, that would tend to contradict almost everything else in the Scripture. That's not what he's saying. That's not what I'm saying. Or at least I'm not trying to say that. So forgive me if I do a bad job of explaining this. But... Um, that's not what the message is. And the second is more driven by our cultural views instead of the views of the Bible. Our culture cannot stand thinking of a God who is supposedly loving and yet would reject some. Even uh, or, or everyone should be welcomed as they are. But that's not in alignment with any portion of the Bible. To be truly and completely honest, it is abundantly clear here by the words of Jesus that that is not not his thought. And that is not the way he looks at people. N.T. Wright says this, There is a difference between this wide-open invitation and the message so many people want to hear today. We want to hear that everyone is all right exactly as they are, that God loves us and, that, 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 and he doesn't want us to change. But that argument doesn't work. When the blind and the lame came to Jesus, he didn't say, you are all right as you are. He healed them. And they wouldn't have been satisfied with anything less. When the prostitutes and extortioners came to Jesus, he didn't say, you're all right as you are. His love reached them where they were, but his love refused to let them stay as they were. Love wants the best for the beloved. Their lives were transformed, healed, and changed. N.T. Wright continues to say, actually, nobody really believes that God wants anyone to stay exactly as they are. God loves serial killers and child molesters. God loves ruthless and arrogant businessmen. God loves manipulative mothers who damage their children's emotions for life. But the point of God's love is that he wants them to change. What Jesus is saying here is that the invitation that beckons us come to the table of the king also beckons, also beckons that we put on a new life and that our lives change and that we move into a new life because we're being invited into new territory and we're being given access into the possibility of new life that we've never before really understood or dreamed or imagined 
But now we can because of God's kindness and because of God's love. Because he's willing to extend the invitation to all of us, no matter who we are. And his kindness and love expressed in this invitation, that, that is all the motivation we need to become a new person. Or at least it should be. Because the truth is, if we aren't making an effort to change, if we, if we aren't making an effort to change, and, and here's the, the reality that I think is true. If we actually make an effort to change, you're going to change. You put forth the in, in, like, intentionality and effort, you will change and transform more into the image of Christ over time. And if you don't, if you don't, then the reality is you probably have no mark of the king's love and invitation to partake in his company and take, partake in his kingdom. So this isn't a working to be saved. This is working because we've been given an invitation to new life. And we want that new life. We want to take hold of that new life. It's being invited And if that doesn't change us or drive us to change, then we haven't truly accepted the invitation that Jesus ultimately extends. Because the invitation does cost us something, to put it simply. It always will. And mainly it's ourselves. After all, Jesus says, if anyone denies themselves and follows me, he says things like, pick up your cross and follow me. So for us to follow Jesus, for us to accept the invitation to be with him, it will cost us who we are. And because to be invited to follow him is also to be invited to become more like him and do what he did. It is not primarily in things that, uh, or, or sorry, the primary thing in which Jesus does and the primary person that Jesus was was a servant. The primary thing that he did was was die on the cross and raise from the dead for our sins. And and the idea of like him being a servant is primary in in his identity because he came to serve and not be served, but to give his life as a ransom for many. So therefore to follow him to be with him has only one trajectory to come like him and do what he did. To follow him is to give ourselves up as he has given himself up. That's the invitation. And some who showed up said, yeah, I'm going to do away with my old life. But it seems as if this man showed up without having done that. If who we were when Jesus found us has not become more sacrificial or less pervasive in our life, we probably haven't truly accepted Jesus' invitation to the table. It would seem that we are only interested in being in the palace or in the courts without really adopting the lifestyle that comes with being in a royal place. It would seem that we want to experience lavish food and lavish drink and dinner parties, but we don't want to change our etiquette to that which would be acceptable in the kingdom. I want to take a second to share a story from the Bible that I think illustrates the idea of giving ourselves up or giving up our lives pretty well. It's in Mark chapter 10. So if you want to open your Bible, turn to Mark chapter 10 with me. Uh, We're going to be talking about the story of of a blind man uh, named Bartimaeus. And, uh, and this is just a, a great story. There's lots of really good nuances in this. I'm not going to tackle anywhere close to all of it, but I am going to tackle just a portion of it that I think is relevant for today. And, um, and so if you will read with me, uh, Mark 10, verse 46 through 52, it says, Then they came to Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they they called the blind man. Cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. 
Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Now, we don't know really anything else about Bartimaeus other than what we hear in this story. We don't hear of Bartimaeus at any other point throughout the scriptures. But what we do know is this is a man of no skill. He has nothing to offer. He's been a beggar his whole life. So how is he going to feed himself? How is he going to clothe himself? How is he going to provide for himself in any tangible way? Right? I mean, that's the question I begin to ask. But the Bible says that when Jesus called him, he threw off his cloak and ran to meet Jesus. Now, this is no small thing because a beggar held his cloak close. It was, it was everything that he owned and where everything he owned was stored. All the money that he was given or resources that he was given was stashed there and stored away in case he would ever need it for anything, uh, whenever it would be handy. It was the thing that protected him from the elements when he was on the street that would keep him protected from, from bad weather, from wind and cold and a storm rolling in. This cloak represents all of Bart Bartimaeus' life in a nutshell. And everything he has, and everything that he had, and he tosses it to the wayside to go meet Jesus. The invitation to come and meet with Jesus, to come and see Jesus face to face, opened this blind man's eyes, even though he still couldn't see, to the possibility of new life that only comes with Christ. He's like, who needs all this stuff? Who needs all this when I've been invited to go face to face with Jesus? His actions depict like this reality, right? That mercy had been given to him by the people of Jericho for years and years and years and years. And that had kept him alive. But the mercy of Jesus, it crucifies that beggar and turns him into a follower. Who he was is now dead. And now he's someone new. Amen. That's what being called and invited to be with Jesus does. It calls us to be something new. And when you can think about all that you are called to give up and all that you are called to lose in order to follow Jesus in light of Bartimaeus' story, it's not discouraging, is it? It's pretty encouraging, isn't it? The question is, can we put ourselves in Bartimaeus' shoes? Do we really think that we're blind and in need of the charity of Jesus or not? Whatever has made up your life and Jesus calls to meet you, man, it, it grows strangely dim, right? You guys know that hymn, right? When Jesus calls and invites, everything else grows strangely dim in the light of his glory, in the light of his grace, in the light of his love, in the light of who he is. And the question that would seem to come to mind, right? when you leave everything to follow Jesus, right? Can you think about what those questions might be? For Bartimaeus, it, I'm assuming, it's like, how am I going to provide for my basic needs, right? What am I going to do now? For us, it may be very different. For us, it may be, how am I supposed to engage with my family who does not follow Jesus? And who thinks that I'm crazy for doing so? How do I have and, and maintain relationships and friendships that I, that I dearly love when, when those around me are bad examples and are destroying the character that I'm trying to build? Because they're not following Jesus. It might simply mean like when Jesus calls you to be with him, you have to give up time and energy and effort that you've dedicated to other places and have neglected to be with him. Maybe for some of us, it's just simply, and I know that this might seem very shallow, but it's all, I mean, it is an 
it is this this is a this is a horrible horrible curse of our day that we spend more time looking at social media than we do reading the word and it might simply mean like no longer being on social media turning your phone off getting a dumb phone how crazy revolutionary would that be but would it help you would it help you change your life you better believe that would change most of our lives in a big way it would it would show that the invitation of Jesus means something to us and we're willing to give up whatever to follow him to be with him to be made new in his likeness and do the things that he did the powerful thing about what happens here is Bartimaeus, it doesn't seem like, is really concerned with any of those questions. He just assumes and believes that Jesus is the answer to them. Or maybe better yet, he's the answer for them. He has complete and utter trust in who Jesus is and what Jesus can do. That all of the former concerns of his life are no longer are no longer there. He's not worried about, how do I eat? How do I stay alive? He's just worried about being with Jesus. The powerful thing about Jesus coming to be with us in the incarnation, John chapter 1, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and Him inviting us to be with Him is that whenever we accept that invitation, we don't have to worry about anything. This is what He teaches us in Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount. Dalton talked about it a few weeks ago. It's great. When we have Jesus, we have everything we need. And nothing else really matters all that much. Because we have Him. We've been joined to Him. We have everything we've ever dreamed of, wanted, desired, and needed because we have Him. He is all of those things. What an invitation! And I, I, we've been invited into this. We've been invited to be with Jesus. And based on what I can see, I think we should just, like, no matter what it costs us, we should just, like, say yes and follow him. Let him become our teacher. Let him become our rabbi. Let him show us how to build our life to this abundant place he promises to give us if we'll follow him. But the question remains, will we accept the invitation? And really, it, the, the question with that is, do we really want to change? Do we really want to change? On any given Sunday in this room, there's a plethora of different people. There are people who are young, people who are old, and there are people who are rich and poor, and there are people whose primary language is not English, and there are people who can't count to ten in Spanish. The room is full of different people from different walks of life and different upbringings and different areas of the United States. And there are some in the room who, when I talk about this story, you immediately resonate with the prostitute and you resonate with the tax collector and you resonate with the sinner and you resonate with those on the street corner. You resonate with blind Bartimaeus. You see your need for Jesus. It doesn't mean that those who feel this or, or, or see this actually, actually move toward him. They just see their need for it. But if they do, and those of you who have, and those of you who have gone to the well to be with Jesus and find living water, you've never been the same. And you have a story of God's goodness and grace that is just covering your life. And it's so powerful. And it beckons and invites more who are like you to come and see the goodness of God. But there are also people that I'm, I'm most concerned for in this room. And it's those who have great jobs and money in the bank. 
those whose kids are really smart and really good at school and pretty successful. They, they're good at sports and other extracurriculars and their marriage is pretty good. Everything seems to check all the boxes. There isn't a whole lot of wants or a whole lot of need that you can't provide in and of yourself. It's the happy and well-to-do, for lack of a better term. That's who I'm worried about. Because comfort and ease in life, something that I think we can all say we've like gone after at one point or another. will often keep us from truly seeing our need for Jesus, our need for his kingdom, and prevent us from accepting the invitation that we've been given. Because what does he have that we don't already have? People whose lives seem good and well put together, those who have grown up in the church and know the Bible fairly well, and now it's just a book on a shelf. We also have to realize that there's a lot Jesus still wants to change in us. That there's a lot that Jesus still wants to do in us and do through us. The question is, will we accept the invitation? Do we really want to change? Because to choose to be with Jesus is to choose to change your life. It's just the natural result of time spent with him. You go to be with him, it will change you. And it will change everything about your life. It will change the way you look at your money, and the way that you look at your marriage, and the way you raise your kids. It will change the way you look at politics. It will change the way that you look at foreign missions. It'll change the way you look at the world. It'll change the way you look at your friendships, the way you look at how you use your house and how you use your cars, the resources that you've been gifted. It will change everything about you. The question is, do you really want to change? I believe that's the invitation. And those who really want it, we leave everything and we enter into the king's courts and we take our seat at his table and we realize there is no better place that we could be. And we are with him and he starts to change us and do amazing things in us. If we just want to be invited to the party but don't want to change who we are, we will be thrown out. feet bound into darkness. Let us not be those people. Let us be people who desire to be with him, to let him change and do something in our lives that we can't do ourselves. And lead us into abundant life. Lead us into his good kingdom, his good grace over and over and over again. So, you've all been given an invitation. Jesus has declared, I want you at my table. Question is, do you want to come? And are you willing to do what it takes to be there and stay there?